This episode may contain content of a graphic nature. Listener discretion is advised. Thanks for joining us today on another episode of Body to Burial. I'm Mariah. And I'm Nikki. We're just two regular true crime junkies who decided it was time to see crime from a new perspective. This is Body to Burial. I know you're a history buff. Mm-hmm. So I did, a little, I did a little research on today's guest. And got a little history of their occupation. So I thought I'd fill you in on that. Oh, I love that. We are talking today with Hillary Parsons, and she is a forensic anthropologist. What is that? So anthropology is obviously like the study of bones. Let's say like you find some bones in your backyard and they would bring out a forensic anthropologist to like determine if they are human or animal. Let's say they are human. They can start to determine like the gender, the potential cause of death, all from the bones. Really? Yeah. So it's really, really fucking cool. It was started kind of in the 19th century through like bones and body fragment fragments there was like some grisly murder cases that were solved but it wasn't until the 1930s that the relationship between like forensic anthropology and the police is like formally acknowledged and if you're a big like true crime buff the gangland murders in the 1930s are the murders that kind of forced the FBI to really like rely on anthropologists It really was like World War II and the Korean War that helped um, kind of develop a database for the information that is used by anthropologists um, because it started with the task of like trying to identify dead soldiers. What? I love that. That's interesting. I think that's going to be pretty cool. I'm really excited to talk to her. That's fun. I can't even determine if my Halloween skeleton is a boy or a girl. I mean, well, maybe today, (laughs) maybe she can give us a lesson on what to look for. How about I just bring Hillary on and we'll let her do her thing and then we can all become educated. Here we go. Hi, this is Hillary. Hey, Hillary, it's Mariah. Hi, how hey, are you? I'm great. How are you? You know, I'm I'm hanging in there. <laughs> awesome. Nikki, this is Hillary. Hillary, this is Nikki. Hello. Hi. We are live. We're doing it. We're doing it. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Okay. I gave Nikki a little, like, Google history of forensic anthropology, so I don't even know if it's accurate. But um, Yeah, who knows? Yeah, you know, I was like, "Uh, why don't you start with, like, what is forensic anthropology? And then kind of tell us how you got into it, because I think that that's super interesting, because I always am, like, fascinated because it's not, like, you know, when you're seven, you're like, I'm going to be a forensic anthropologist. Like, I'm always curious, like how people like found out that that is like a job. To start, um, you know, I'm, my name is Dr. Hillary Parsons and I am a forensic anthropologist. What that means is that I primarily study and work with human skeletal remains. Uh, many people kind of associate my profession with the TV show Bones, mm. right? And mm-hmm. so, yes. Sometimes I get the nickname Bones, you know, when I'm doing a a project. Uh, It's quite common. I I guess it's a thing. Um, I'm also an archaeologist and currently a deputy principal investigator with Drayton Archaeology here in in Blaine, Washington. And so I get to incorporate my forensic background into uh, archaeology as well. And there's there's so much overlap in those disciplines. I got into it totally by accident. I was uh, this aspiring and very good student, you know, successful. I get to college, but I have no idea. I I like everything. I'm doing all these things and kind of having fun with it. And then you're going to laugh. One of the nights I I was uh, watching TV in my, in my room, an episode of CSI came on. I I kid you not. (laughs) And I wasn't like a big fan of show or anything. And I was just kind of just getting started. And they actually had an episode featuring a forensic anthropologist. There you go. There you go. (laughs) And this forensic anthropologist was, it was, she was a woman, you know, and I'm like, whoa, who is this person? <laughs> They've got the skeleton like laid out on like a, you know, like a table in a medical examiner's office, you know, and she's like looking at it and she takes one look at it and she starts rearranging all the bones. <laughs> and it's like kind of funny because like these these crime scene investigators had gotten that all wrong. Right. And so she's like redoing it all like on a way like really quickly. And I'm like, who is this wizard? Yeah. And so I watched the episode and I was like the next day, what? is a forensic anthropologist, you know, and my advisor's like, oh, yeah. (laughs) And he's like, well, you know, 
I took a class on that in college. Like, I still have my old notes. Let's do an independent study for you on that. And I was like, okay. (laughs) Yeah. And so he kind of like quick and dirty trained me up and it kind of got me hooked. And then I, of course, got all the formal you know, training over the years. And, um, and that, that's just kind of how it all happened. And thanks to CSI. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> well, I guess that is like one of the beauties about these shows, though, to be honest, is like as kids get older and they see their parents watching this stuff or they walk in and out of rooms, it's like it really does open up this whole world of occupations that like otherwise you never hear of. Yeah. And they call that kind of the, the CSI effect as well. And that's like bringing awareness to um, this whole world that's out there within, you know, the medical legal community. And, um, you know, I know at the University of Tennessee, you've probably heard there's the the body farm down there. I don't know if you guys have yep. heard of the uh, body yeah, farm. Yep. Yeah. So it's basically, and, and I, and we hate that term, but it's called the anthropological research facility is what it is. Um, and it was, you know, started, um, back in the late seventies, early eighties. And it was to understand this, you know, concept of decomposition and how, um, the human body decomposes. So a lot of the science uh, and our understanding of of decompositional forces and, and occurrences is because of the research that's come out of that university and out of this facility. And so they would have people donate their bodies to the facility to decompose so that we could do these studies. But then after, you know, CSI really took off and other spinoff programs, um, the facility kept receiving donations. I mean, they're at over capacity. They have to stop they had to stop accepting requests That's you know, crazy. because they're yeah. full. Now we have so much more to work with and so much more to understand. And, you know, and every time that you do a study, it really does spur more questions and it does answer. So, you know, it's this, you know, this cascading effect of, of research um, that has occurred. And it's not just at the, you know, the Forensic Anthropology Center, you know, down in Tennessee, it's all these other places as well. And, um and I think that that's a really positive um, effect of, of these TV shows. It brings awareness. It is bringing um, resources. It is bringing funding, um, you know, and 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 more scientific um, discoveries. And and that's that's really exciting. So there there's definitely good things. Um, you know, I would just wish people would keep expectations in check. But yes, <laughs> that's just the, yeah. the way we yeah. are as a human species, right? And so, <laughs> I, you know, I also as a forensic anthropologist, I work um, with also work with various organizations teaching law enforcement and crime scene investigators about forensic anthropology and why it's important to include a forensic anthropologist when they have cases involving human remains, uh, particularly skeletal remains um, or severely decomposed remains as well. So there's still, you know, soft tissue on the bones, but it's, you know, degrading. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It gets kind of, um, you know, uh, it, it gets pretty intense at times, but that's that's what we're here for. Um, yeah, it's it's great because, um, you know, law enforcement professionals are always so amazed at the diverse skill set that we we have and how we can help them because they just had no clue. Or maybe they've seen the show Bones, but they don't really understand how that would translate into like their work. Um, and it's kind of fun because we get to have fun, hands on instruction with them and do field exercises to get them familiar with the kinds of techniques that we use with one of these cases. And I don't know why I'm picturing it like, um, uncovering dinosaur bones, like with a little brush, like, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's funny because we're, we don't do dinosaurs. And every time you say, Hey, I'm an anthropologist, everybody thinks Jurassic park. You're like, no, 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 not that kind of <laughs> ology. I'm the other ology. Um, I'm not paleontology. I'm the anthropology. And so you have to kind of explain that I work with human skeletal remains, but yes, as a matter of fact, the techniques are very similar in that you, uh, once you encounter, um, you know, bones, you've got to slow everything down and use your little paint brushes and your little wooden <laughs> tools and your picks and, you know, be very gentle and careful to, you know, expose the remains and, you know, you're not too far off. Okay, you're not good. too far off there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I also consult with um, organizations um, that work with the Department of Defense and we uh, search and recover U.S. service members from World War I and from Vietnam. So, you know, that work kind of combines the archaeology and the forensics. As I mentioned, you know, before there's overlap in those two fields. And, and that's a pretty amazing experience and something that's, um, you know, very important to do as well. And so walk us through how that whole process works. Cause that's super fascinating. Yeah, it is really fascinating. So we have a number of, you know, U.S. personnel that um, are MIA or POWs from, um, you know, World War II or Vietnam or Korea, Korean War. Um, and then, um, 
they, for whatever reason, um, were left behind. They weren't, they didn't come home. The remains didn't come home. And so, uh, you know, the, there's a national imperative to return those uh, missing service members home. And so um, the Department of Defense has a uh, separate division called the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency that goes out and, and has a team of anthropologists um, to go out and recover uh, the remains of, of the soldiers who never came home. And so um, I get to consult and kind of work on those projects here and there Whoa, you know, every now and then. That is really interesting. How does that work? So they call you in, they have... Like how many bones are you looking at typically? Is there like 10 or five? It completely depends. You know, okay. it really depends on the situation. Uh, there's so many different variables involved um, in the successful recovery. Um, you know, it depends on the conditions surrounding uh the, you know, the battle conditions that were occurring. It, mm-hmm. it depends on the physical environment that they're in. Um, you know, if, if the soil is uh, able to preserve uh, the organic material, like the bones or not. So it's highly variable. Are there still say like civil war, like on some of those battlegrounds, can you still recover yeah. like a bone or anything like that from there? It, it, again, it's going to depend on that environment, but it's totally possible. You know, we can recover bones, you know, from cases going back a lot, hundreds of years. And then in the work that I do in archeology, span um, here, particularly in the Pacific Northwest where I live, uh, you know, there are so many native American, Mm -hmm. um, burials and, and remains that are everywhere that have persisted for thousands and thousands of years. Right. And so you always hear about like, um, you know, excavations that are conducted in, you know, other countries where they're recovering remains from, uh, various environments, like the volcano, volcano eruptions, or there's, uh, uh, sunken ships in the ocean where there's remains. I mean, so it just really depends on on the conditions. You obviously can't tell that's like Bob Jones or, you know, like that sort of thing with bones, right? Right. So you've got a soldier, they think. First question would be, what can we determine from the bones? What are the things that we can know and how do we go about finding out those things? Yeah, so let's let's back this conversation up a little bit and talk about what it is that forensic anthropologists actually do and kind of where like our limitations are yeah. in our science. Um, so forensic anthropologists, you know, we uh, recover remains. Um, we are able to then make sure to properly clean them and then we can do our analysis. And what we're looking for are features that are going to help us narrow down a pool of potential candidates that this person could be. So when you're working on a missing persons case um, and there's a, you know, uh, a, what we call a clandestine burial in the woods somewhere and clandestine means kind of like a secret or hidden grave. It's, you know, the criminal, you know, the, the suspects attempt to cover their crime by, you know, concealing the body. So you go out and you recover this person. And, and a lot of times they're, you know, the criminal is trying to remove uh, evidence of who they are. Like they don't have, you know, this person may not have their wallet on them or any uh, jewelry or kind of things that might um, be associated with that person. Um, and so you're you're relying on, on the bones to tell the story of who that person is. We can do an assessment of the remains and estimate things such as the person's uh, biological sex. So um, we're looking at the characteristics that kind of differentiate um, a male from a female person. And so primarily that looks um, different in, you know, your hips, right? In your pelvic area, because women have this amazing capability to give birth to children (laughs) and men don't. And so, and that changes a lot of the shape and appearance of the bones that are involved in the um, pelvic, that are, that comprise the pelvic region. You know, we can also look at the person's age. We can, um, tell pretty well um, the age of younger individuals because they follow very predictable growth and development patterns from, you know, birth until, you know, like late 20s, you know, mid to late 20s. And then um, we can uh, look at kind of degenerative markers in older individuals. So things like, you know, bone density, we can look at some of the wear and tear factors on the body um, that can kind of give us a a more broad range. So we're actually more accurate in younger individuals than we are in older individuals. We also look at the person's um, ancestry. And and actually, this is an area of research that I am heavily involved in. And a lot of my dissertation research dealt with the issue of ancestry in modern forensic work. And 
basically what that means is that we're looking to see if we can understand where this person's population history is to kind of infer what their social race category might be. And it's completely imperfect. <laughs> you know, I mean, to try from a set of bones to tell, um, you know, a police officer who or an investigator or coroner, or whoever is investigating the case, you know, what color their skin was, is it's very difficult from from the bones. But we can have there's certain clues that give us an idea of where their deep ancestral history might originate. And that might um, translate into a skin color, um, but that's very difficult. And trying to get that message across to law enforcement is also um, very difficult. And then we can also look at height, um, how tall the person was when they died. Um, and again, that's an estimation and really is most helpful for people who are short and like really short and then people who are really tall. Otherwise, everybody kind of fits that general pattern. Everybody, <laughs> you know, is kind of around the same height, you know, with, you know, within our within our um, error estimates. So our methods are imperfect and it requires quite a bit of interpretation. But um, what it can do is like, you know, if we've got a, a missing person who is six foot five, but the individual re recovered is nowhere near that, we know we can kind of eliminate that person as a possibility. If we... Uh, are looking for a male individual, but the person that's recovered it turns out to be female, well, we've just eliminated that person as a possibility. Some of the more, I guess, definitive things that we can do mm -hmm. is look at specific markers, like if a person had a surgery or and they've got some um, surgical implements still in their body, like plates or screws, you know, those are helpful because a lot of times those can have serial numbers. And if those serial numbers were um, recorded to that patient, then we can um, track that down. That's crazy. Uh, we could, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we can look at x-rays too, you know, so if they had x-rays in life, you know, yeah. like we, can, we can compare because when bones heal after being broken, like you break a rib, you know, that bone's going to heal. Yeah. And so we can see that a lot of times it leaves like a little scar on the bone. And so we can compare that to medical records of somebody who's missing, if those medical records are available to us, then we can say, oh, yep, this is where they broke it. It's in the same spot where the scar is. You can make an inference there that, you know, it's another piece of, of evidence or another tool in your toolkit to try to identify that person. That is wild. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many more. There's so many more things. <laughs> when you said like surgical stuff, I was thinking like breast implants. Would that still be there and stay or does that disintegrate? Yeah. So those will often, depending on the condition of the remains, those could be gone. Oh, right. Okay. And so those aren't something that's going to preserve very well. But the other thing is so many women these days, you know, for a, a number of amazing reasons, get um, implants. And so it's not necessarily like a nail down factor that this is going to be that. Person's. Yeah. And, and, and we run into so many problems with surgical um, implants too. depend no, no matter what the, you know, the device is, yeah. but um, because it, it's so important that the doctor record that serial number right on that person's chart. Yeah. And a lot of times if that doesn't happen, because when a surgeon is putting a you know, metal plate into somebody's broken leg, they're not thinking that, oh, this is what's going to identify them when they're deceased and missing. Yes. You know, it's like they, they're not thinking about that. <laughs> and so they don't necessarily, they, they might not record that information, but if they do, then that's helpful for us. But if they don't, you know, you just got to do a little bit more digging. Yeah. I had two questions that I wrote down while you mm -hmm. were talking. So like one of the things that I had read that you had mentioned, like a lot of times, you know, please expect you to be able to name the race. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I was reading is that there were like racial identifiers, like such as like the length of a jaw or the space between eye sockets. So like, I guess that's not accurate. Like there isn't a chart of measurements that you look at and are like, okay, this person's jaw is so many inches. So they must be Caucasian. Ah, so there is, but there isn't a set of standards. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we... Um, have spent the better part of a, you know, a half a century trying to identify characteristics that are consistent with different groups, like say African Americans or European Americans or Asian um, individuals. And so really trying to say, what are the characteristics that define this group? But unfortunately, um, you know, the real world doesn't work that way. And so although we can grab, you know, a sample of, uh, you know, we, all these skeletal collections, people love to donate their bodies to science. And so their skeleton is available for study. And so we've got a whole group of European, um, you know, descendant people in this group over here. And then we've got another skeletal collection of African individuals over here and uh, a group of Native American, you know, remains over here that we can that we can take measurements from or do visual observations. And we can therefore, you know, say, oh, in this group, we see this particular feature. And that feature is not present over in this group, 
most of the time. Or, oh, the average width between the eye orbits on this uh, population is this many wide. And then the average on this many, you know, on, on this other collection is this wide. But there's also some people over in this group that have the same measurement of people over in that group over there. And so, you know, we, we get ourselves into trouble because there's no absolute measurement or characteristic phys- physical feature on like one group's um, set of skeletal remains in another groups. Okay. And, and and that's basically because human variation is is so broad and there's more variation that exists within a population group than between groups of people. That's where we get into trouble is that we have generalizations for population groups and that works really, really well when you're talking about you know, differences of populations. And maybe when you're doing an archaeological study of, you know, a a cemetery in London versus a cemetery, you know, in China, that that might work very well. But when you're trying to identify an individual for forensic reasons, because this person, there's this one individual who has gone missing, you, it's not always accurate. And it's not always precise. And and you're looking for precision in forensics. And I think that that's like a huge misconception, you know, is that, um, you know, our science is so precise and so absolute when really it's it's not. It comes down to, you know, the methods and techniques that you're using, your experience level using those methods and techniques and, and, and who you're looking at, whose fate, you know, whose skull is in front of you. And there's a lot there's a lot of variance there. A lot of times, too, you might have a person who is on the outside looks to be a, a like, say, a white or Caucasian individual. That's what they, they look like. That's how they identify in life. Their parents are that way. Their grandparents are that way. But they have some features that are not consistent or what we have what we have ascribed as a, is consistent with that group. If your person doesn't quite fit that even though they identify that way anyway, you know, then, you know, you could, you could say that person is of mixed ancestry when they're not, yeah. or when they don't consider themselves to be that way. And that could hinder an identification. And a lot of times forensic anthropologists, when they see this mixture of characteristics and traits and in, in skeletal remains, they will say, oh, I, this person could potentially be of mixed ancestry. And it's like, ah, uh, but now you're just kind of you know, hedging your bets yeah. just to make sure you're not wrong. Because if you're wrong and you say this person is is an Asian, you know, individual or comes from some sort of Asian, but which is also very broad, right? Because there's so many different Asian groups that have very many different characteristics. But you would, you know, say this person is, uh, you know, most likely of Asian ancestry, but they're they're they consider themselves to be, you know, a, a European, like a white individual. Mm-hmm. Um, their family is that way. The missing persons report that the cops put together say that they're white, you know. And so what you're doing, what happens then is you could potentially miss that person in the identification. It can be very complicated and very hard because we are so very much expected to provide this information, but it can be difficult. Um, and there are confounding um, factors in that. And so the field is really evaluating this problem actively right now and trying to figure out, like, what is our standard going to be moving forward and what is this going to look like in the coming years? And what about like, um, can you take like a sample of the bone and then you can tell like how long that person's been gone? Or no, does it not work like that? No, yeah, so like uh, bone sampling is really um, is primarily primarily done for um, di- uh, for, for DNA um, in order to obtain a sample of DNA so that they can try to um, match that person up with a, with the genetic code if that is on file somewhere. Um, or um, bone samples can be taken to do isotope analysis, and isotopes just kind of um, give you an idea of the kind of food that that person was eating and what kind of environment they're living in to kind of give you an idea of you know where they're where they might be from. So that's um, crazy. You can tell what their diet mainly consists of. You can. You know, there are certain iso- there are isotope markers that can tell you what the primary food source is. This is very much so used in archaeology. Okay, um, and it's just to try to kind of construct the life ways of past people. Like what were these people eating? And, you know, and so um, isotopes can help support the archaeological evidence. Uh, But yeah, isotope analysis is becoming more and more of a thing in in forensics. And it's not an area that I specialize in, but I know it's out there. So yeah, but the way to try to determine if somebody, how long somebody has been deceased or how old the bones are, um, that's done through kind of other ways. So um, archaeologically, you are looking at 
different cultural markers? Like, was that individual buried with any kind of grave goods that might date to a certain time, known time period in, um, you know, pre-contact history? Or um, if you're looking at um, soils that the person was buried in, you can do a soil analysis, um, like radiocarbon dating of that. You can also radiocarbon date the remains themselves. It's, it can be destructive. And so, um, you know, you have to take a sample and that sample is destroyed. So sometimes it can be difficult to do that if, if that you don't want to destroy the remain portions of the remains. But uh, so archaeologically, um, you can kind of determine how long that body has been there or with how or with the bones date to. But then in modern forensic casework, um, we're trying to figure out how long that person has has um, been there so that we can try to narrow down, um, you know, say, uh, say like, oh, this person was last seen on this date. Well, does the condition of the remains support that or or not? Is it consistent with that last known time that they were seen? And if so, it's like, okay, so then who was that? So around that time, who was associated with this individual during that time? Retrace what was going around at that time when the person, um, you know, died. So there's, there's different um, ways to kind of determine that. And one of the things that we use is a, is a ta term called taponomy and taponomy is kind of the study of everything that happens to the body um, from the time of death to the time of discovery. And so it's really looking at the rate of decomposition and all the factors involved in decomposition. You know, that includes all the, the environmental aspects, like the time and the temperature and the humidity the elevation <laughs> scavengers all the animals that are in, like if, if the body's out in the woods and like what kind of animals would come to the body and when and what kind of insects um would call it would come to the body and colonize and you know disintegrate those remains and you know all those things and so there's a number of, of factors you know involved in that kind of research as well and so forensic anthropologists are involved in that too wow <laughs> so. yeah i was thinking about that with animals like obviously animals are gonna probably get to it does that make it a little more like hard for you to tell in the manner of which they've died yeah like basically what happens an animal can remove pieces of evidence so they they will remove limbs and carry them away or yeah different rodents will chew on things there's animals that will take you know fingers into their little burrows <laughs> oh my god you know, and they pull the remains apart and they can be spread for very long distances, oh, yeah. actually. And so what that does, and, and that speeds up the rate of decomposition, right? So when you are destroying, you know, you don't, you no longer have an intact body that's slowly decomposing. Now you've got all these pieces that can rapidly decompose. So it, it changes our time since death estimates. Um, we have to take those uh, factors, you know, into play. And then, you know, but you can tell the difference between, you know, the marks that an animal leaves when it's chewing on bones versus trauma that has happened to the body as a result of the circumstances surrounding their death. How long are you working out like on a, a crime scene or a scene? You know, um, I wish that happened. <laughs> so one of the biggest challenges that we have in our field is that law enforcement either doesn't know about forensic anthropologists, or if they do, they just know they can't afford us. And so they don't utilize us. Forensic anthropologists are so underutilized in this field. And so um, there are a few full-time practicing forensic anthropologists that work in medical examiner's offices across the country. Um, and of course, those um, cities have access to them. So when they have a situation involving remains that they need an anthropologist for, they can call them out immediately. You know, they're employed by the city or the state already. And so it's not any issue for law enforcement. But when you've got a, a town, a smaller town or um, an area where there isn't a forensic anthropologist available, you know, the cops are out there, you know, they don't make a phone call to somebody. They don't know who to call, um, you know, and they just go out and they recover the remains themselves. And then on the back end, they get, you know, the case is going to court and the attorney saying, well, we need a forensic anthropologist. And the cops are like, well, I don't even know where to get one of those. Yeah. And then they find one. Then we, then the, you know, the attorney finds one or, you know, somebody finds one. And then at that point, it's just a box of bones on the desk. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of times that happens. But as far as in the ideal case, and there was a situation that I was in where it was completely ideal and 100% done the way it needed to be. It can take, uh, it's variable, but obviously like if you've got a, um, a body that's on the surface, you can recover that 
typically in a day or less. And then, um, you know, your analysis is just going to take as long as it as it needs to. And it can take, um, you know, a few days okay. um, to do your analysis, write up your report, you know. And then, of course, there's um, uh, if the case goes to trial, you have to testify. But I would think every major police department would have someone like you to be on, you know, because I would assume that obviously murders and crimes happen daily. I was, I'm shocked to hear that you, that's not the case. You're not alone <laughs> in thinking that and that you're shocked because that's one of the other, you know, misconceptions of our field is that there's all this, this is this endless amount of resources available at all times, yeah. everybody who needs it. And, you know, particularly in large, you know, precincts or large cities. And, and that's not the case at all. That is wild. I can't really speak to law enforcement, but a lot of people that I talk to who work in crime scene investigation, they're like, I have to, if I need an extra pen, I need to put in a request for it. And I might not get my extra pen because there's no money in the budget for an extra pen, you know, and then let alone going out and trying to find a forensic anthropologist to work this skeletal case, you know, yeah. that's out in the woods or, you know, uh, you know, and, and it's like they can't afford to spend that time. Another situation is you've got an informant in prison who wants, you know, to, uh, you know, bargain a little bit for their sentence. And they say, well, I know, you know, of where this body might be located. This guy I know killed, you know, his girlfriend and buried her in woods. I know where it is. Like, you know, help me out here. Yeah. And then, you know, at that point, you know, that's what, that's when they should be calling a forensic anthropologist to do a search. I'm not saying that cops don't, but um, there are definitely circumstances, you know, definitely there's knowledge that we have that we've been trained for to do this. And then when we locate the grave, we know exactly what to do step by step from there. And when those steps get missed, because a forensic anthropologist is not involved in the case, that's when you start losing evidence. You start losing context. Yeah. And and then there's just, and then down the road, there's that box of bones on the desk that now a forensic anthropologist who's been involved like at way too late of the stage has to deal with. And you, you it can compromise the case significantly. And that's how the majority of cases go. That is crazy. You know, when I teach these classes to law enforcement professionals and crime scene investigators, they're like, man, we wish we had one of you on staff. Yeah. And I think there's I there's like only I, I can count on one hand the number of law enforcement agencies in this country that actually has a forensic anthropologist. And when they have that person on staff, their caseload, it's it's so much more manageable. Yeah. <laughs> they have better outcomes, everything. They know when they have, you know, a decomposing individual or they have skeletal remains, they know what's going to happen and how it's going to be handled. That person can work collaboratively with other agencies with, you know, in that office. Um, and that person can also do other things when there's not an active skeletal case going on. Cause it's not like you get a case every day, but trying to find the budget to put that person, <laughs> you know, on staff <laughs> is the challenge. It all comes down to money. Yeah. Yeah. Hillary, I have a ton of questions and they're probably going to bounce okay. <laughs> bounce us around to things that we've already covered. So my first question is how you mentioned there's like kind of like a lack of individuals that do your job within the police department. And a lot of that is money. But I also wonder, mm -hmm. do you think that it's part of like lack of education and like understanding or are they worried because like it's not always an exact science or is it really truly always just a money issue? Uh, I think it's it's money and it's the lack of education about what we do. Those are the two things. I don't necessarily think it's because it's not the most exact, you know, science. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't think it's that at all because we do provide so many amazing things. And even though it's not exact, we can really do a good job of narrowing the pool of potential missing persons. Yeah. I mean, and also we don't just do identification as well. We are trying to establish the time since death, all the different factors that were contributing to the condition of the remains, you know, when we, when they were found. Um, and then also we can interpret trauma. If they sustained a gunshot wound or if they um, were, you know, stabbed or if they were strangled or if they were beaten, you know, those things are very telling on the remains. And a lot of it's physics, which is a much more hard science, right? And so we apply uh, physics to um, the, the bone mechanics, like how the bone responds to a trauma, because your bones are not just hard. They're actually uh, living tissue as well. And they respond um, as living tissue, just hard living tissue. And we can apply physical principles to that. So, you know, how a gunshot um, affects 
uh, say the skull versus if they were shot in the chest and it hits a rib, you know, there's yep. a different, there's different mechanics involved. And so, you know, there's quite a bit that we can do um, to help. And so I don't necessarily think it's that third option that you presented, yep. but it's mostly the funding and it's just in lack of knowledge of what all the things that we can do. Do you ever run into, is there kind of like this idea of you can solve everything and you can do everything. Yeah. And I think that's that CSI effect. It's not necessarily within law enforcement or uh, crime scene investigation that you get that idea. That's really for the public crime scene shows like CSI and, and, and bones and, you know, you know, the law and order, all those things where there's this expectation that the science is always going to be able to tell you the answer or that the science moves so rapidly and like, you know, everything or that, you know, I don't understand why the fingerprint analyst doesn't under, you know, know why this person's, you know, bones look this way. And it's like, well, the fingerprint analyst doesn't know anything about the bones. That's why, you right, know, that's it's not like, their job. you know, yeah. yeah. When you watch CSI, it's like, they're the jack of all trades. They do everything. Like they're out investigating the crime and they're doing the fingerprint analysis and they're, you know, you know, doing the crime scene, you know, technician's job. And they're, you know, looking at the blood evidence. It's like, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah. It's not like a quick 20 minute you know, never. <laughs> yeah. And it's like that show bones, you know, I don't need, I, I, sh- I should be more fair because I don't watch the show because I can't like <laughs> sure. I watched it. I think I'm sure it's a great show, but I, you know, for, for funsies, but like, I remember the episodes I have watched, it's like, you know, the main character, the forensic anthropologist, I think her name is Temperance Brennan. Um, she, she's on the side, she like looks and there's a set of remains and she's looking at it. And she's like, Oh, this is a female. And Oh, it looks like she's had, you know, kids. And it's like, no, you can't, you know, <laughs> You can't do that. You know, and it's like you you really can't tell. That's so, you know, like trying to determine if the person had kids is actually very bad science and kind of disproven. And and so it's kind of frustrating because everybody thinks that you can just look quickly at something and know and really it takes a lot of time and effort. Yeah, like Nikki and I were joking before you joined us. We're both like really big Halloween fanatics. And so we both have these yeah. like life-size skeletons. And Nikki's like, I wonder if we could like figure out if it's male or female. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just saying like in my theory, I was thinking like males in general, I would think their bones would be like larger or like, I don't know. Yes. Thicker. Yes, you're right. Males are what we call more robust. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good word. They have larger bodies in general. Notice how I couch everything with like the, you know, the qualifying descriptors at the end, like in general. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, um, there's always an exception. Yep. And there's and there's difference amongst population groups, too. So like, you know, people of Asian ancestry or, uh, you know, um, Hispanic, which is a, also a very problematic term because there's so many different people um, with different ancestries in that Hispanic group. But they tend to be, you know, smaller on average. And the men and women tend to be more consistent in size with each other than, say, like, you know, in a, you know, American population of American white um, individuals or African-American individuals where you see see, you know, major differences between men and women. And that's, again, in general, I always like to use the example of Serena and Venus Williams, because my gosh, those women are extremely muscular Mm -hmm. and strong because they have, they have built their bodies to be that way. They have worked so hard to create that muscular system for them to perform at their best in their careers. And so when you are, when you are working those muscles in that way, all the bodybuilders out there, you know, you're going to have bigger, stronger bones with more muscle attachments that are visible on the bones because, you know, the bone responds to the stresses that are put on the body. And so if your muscles require bigger surface areas to attach to, your bones are going to respond in that way. And so it's not, you know, your bones, you know, they change through time, right? And then, you know, eventually they degenerate. So like, you know, you can never always just assume just because the bones are bigger that it's a male because you you really have to dig deeper than that. That's weird. That is so wild. I mean, it's so amazing. (laughs) It is. It's fascinating. I'm thinking about because I'm a big cracker. Like I like to crack and, you know, crack my knuckles. And (laughs) does that change bones and, and stuff like that too or no? That's a joint thing. So that's like the, the capsule that's a releasing air. So it's like a pressurized air that you're releasing when you pop your joint, like when you crack your knuckles. Oh, okay. There was always that old wives tale that you're going to get arthritis yes. or whatever if you do that. I, you know, honestly, I don't know if that's true or not, but I've kind of heard not. And I've been, I'm like you, I've been cracking my knuckles since I was a child yes. and I'm fine. It just feels <laughs> but, fantastic. Like, but it doesn't leave any lasting mark on the bone. Like you wouldn't find Nikki's remains and be like, 
she was an excessive knuckle popper. <laughs> no, I would say this person is suffering from arthritis. I wouldn't say that they were an excessive knuckle, you know, cracker. You know? Like that's... Another question that I had, which is going back to the very beginning of our conversation when we were talking about the war veterans, what records did they have from World War II? Were they at that point in time taking like detailed health information that you're able to compare the bones to? Yes. Um, so very crude, like I wouldn't say crude, but it's um, not like it is today where we have okay. tons of different um, x-rays and we can do DNA now, you know, so, uh, you know, there's, it's more extensive right now. And we, and, and also just like the x-rays or radiographs of the dentition, you know, we take yep. that, you know, that's all done now with the military, um, on their intake. But, um, back then, back, like say in World War II, um, their records were mostly, you know, handwritten. Okay. There might be some chest x-rays. So like back in World War II, what they would do or prior to World War II, they would take a chest x-ray of the person to check for tuberculosis mm-hmm. to make sure that they didn't have that. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were checking for that disease pattern. So you have, you know, just coincidentally have this, like most of the time, not all the time, have a chest, chest x-ray in, in general, it, the, the records were less extensive but what they did do was document yes their height they you know and they take their picture um you know with the height ticks and you know behind them you know they had their blood type can you can't tell that from their bones though right no, okay. no, no, no. okay the, what we can use as anthropologists um we can use their dental records so although they didn't have uh, radiographs of their dentition, they had dental charts. Mm-hmm. So they could chart the teeth that were missing, the teeth that had cavities, the teeth that had fillings, um, you know, uh, those kinds of things. And so, um, and then even back then, the military doctors, like if they, um, the dentists, if they did a, a filling, they would actually draw the filling in in the shape of the filling oh, on wow. the tooth, on the picture, on the picture of the tooth, like, you know, on a, a chart yeah. so that you could see the picture. Um, so I am not an odontologist, but I know that they can use dental charts, but more commonly now they're using the radiographs to do comparisons. Is that like a chart? Like I go to the dentist every six months to get my teeth cleaned and say I go missing. Mm -hmm. Could the police or I'm going to get this wrong. Odontologist that matches the dental records. Is that how that works? Yeah. So, um, so if you go missing, um, and you're, family and friends know who your dentist is. Okay. (laughs) Pro tip, pro tip. If your family doesn't know who your dentist is, tell them. Right? (laughs) Because if the cops don't know where to go to find your records, it's not like they can just go, you know, they they need to know where where to find your records. Dentist's office, um, uh, depending on the particular office or the state, you know, um, they will oftentimes get rid of dental records of a patient they haven't seen after a certain period of time. It can, you know, several years, you know, if you're going regularly to the dentist, they will have your records Mm. and that can be used. Yeah. But yeah. And we have problems with, you know, people who are more marginalized in our society. So homeless population Uh or runaways, um, you know, it's like, so you, you find, unfortunately you find the their remains but you have nowhere to go you, you don't know who this person is you don't know um you've all the missing persons cases that you have in your area where you've got dental records for none of them match that individual you're just kind of like gotta, i don't know who this person is and then if you take a dna sample from their bones and you send it off but if that person's not in the system if they're not you know if they've never been involved in a crime where dna yeah um was taken from the, you know you don't you don't know at that point i would wish that it would be like ancestry.com you have the dna and then but i know that's not legal connect it to like the cousin or the second cousin some cases like that where they're cold cases it's like can i just sneak this in real quick just to get an idea just to let the families know. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's a whole nother thing, right? Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, trying to figure out um, how how that service could be possible and useful and not violating privacy and all those things. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of... A lot of issues there yeah. um, that I'm certainly not not an expert in, but, it, you know, I'm a little bit of aware of. Yeah. But you're right. That would be kind of helpful, right? Yeah. If you came across a human skull and some of the teeth are missing or maybe some of the cheekbone, um, like I know animals and weather and all those things can play an effect. But Nikki and I were talking about this, too, is like how long can bones like actually last? Like, is it kind of like... Um, a fingerprint, like if it's preserved well, it can stay forever, or do they eventually mm-hmm. start breaking down themselves? Uh, all of the above. Bones can last for, depending on the environmental conditions, like you just said, they can they can deteriorate very quickly, 
or they can persist for a very, very, very long time, thousands of years. And then, of course, you know, they can fossilize in conditions as well. So like when you think about um, so another branch of anthropology is kind of what we call paleoanthropology. And that's, you know, uh, the study of humans before we were, you know, modern homo sapiens. So you're looking at, you know, the Neanderthals and the all the Australopithecines and all the pre-hominid um, species that existed prior to humans, right? And so um, those are all fossils. So they've fossilized so that that bone is actually mineralized. Fossils um, can persist for very long periods of time. Um, actual um, organic bone can persist for very long periods of time. I mean, thousands of time, you know, thousands of years. So I went to the catacombs in Paris. Those have been there since. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I gotta look that up. Yeah, but like. 1800s or 1700s or whatever it is. They can last for a very long time. Right? <laughs> yeah, especially especially in those kind of like, you know, controlled conditions. You know, if you took those bones out and buried them, you know, in in the ground, depending on the soil chemistry, mm-hmm. um, you know, they could deteriorate pretty rapidly or they could stay. It just depends. What about like a tooth? A tooth? Oh, good question. A tooth preserves much, much longer because of that hard enamel. Oh, okay. And so teeth? Teeth, we are very good. Um, teeth preserve very, very, very well. They will outlast bones, you know, the skull around it. Because of that protective enamel, that's where you can reliably get a sample of DNA, too. Oh, wow. I didn't even think you could get DNA from a tooth. Yeah, yeah. When you're processing the bones to try to get information, because like, for instance, with the fingerprint examiner, they can only run like one test. So they have to decide this is what I'm going to run because I'm in jeopardy of like compromising the fingerprint. So is it like the same thing with bones? Like if you run one test, like that's it? Or can you run like multiple tests? It's it's a little different than the fingerprint analysis. And so um, what we're doing when we're running tests, like actual like chemical analysis on a test, yeah. for example, like say DNA. So you segment part of the bone, you take a piece of it. So it's common common practice to take a piece of like one of the bones of the leg because it's, you know, I, there's many places you can get DNA from the bones and there we do, we actively do studies to figure out the best place to get a viable DNA sample because DNA will degrade in the body as well. Also dependent on those conditions we just talked about, all the environmental conditions, but you'll cut out a, a segment with a bone saw and then send it off to the lab but that's it. You know, that's what you run on it. So if you do run, you run DNA on it, it's not like you can then take that bone and do much else with it. You can do, um, you know, you can do histology on a bone too. And histology is like looking at the cells of the bone. So you cut a very, 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 very thin slice of that bone with a special tool, like a special saw and put it under the microscope and you can examine the structure of the bone. And that tells that that's very helpful in determining if this is like a uh, an animal, like a non-human animal bone, or if it's human, because, you know, a lot of times you run into, huh, this happens a lot too in forensic anthropology, you know, you get people that bring in, you know, I found this bone in the woods, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's a deer bone, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. but typically you're running one test at a time on a on a piece of bone. And, and it, again, we try to minimize that. And so, um, because we don't want to destroy the remains, and particularly if you've only got one thing to work with, you don't want to be destroying it. If I you know, had a family member that maybe their death was ruled as like accidental, but I felt like there was like foul play involved. Would I be able to like obtain your private services to like exhume their body and have you take a look at it? Like, is that something that you guys would privately do? Yep. You would go through an attorney to do that. So you would contact somebody to represent you who would then contact me Mm -hmm. um, to do an exhumation. Yeah. An exhumation. Is that something you do often? Mm -hmm. I haven't done it, but I have had colleagues who have. Yep. And so you can examine the remains. Hmm? Are they usually doing that for the sole purpose of like arguing cause of death? It does happen. And and exhumations also happen a lot of times. Like if the a body will um, oftentimes be buried if we don't know who it is. And so like they, mm. so if nobody comes to claim, to claim the it. body yeah. ever, yeah, they put them in, you know, kind of a potter's field, you know, where a, a field, you know, a cemetery of unknowns. And so those number, you know, those individuals are cataloged um, and there's no burial location. And so like if cold case comes along, it's like, well, let's exhume this body because we actually think it's this person mm. um, after, you know, the cold case investigator has done some work and it's like, hmm, this person actually might be buried over here. So let's exhume the body and do the analysis and see. Um, and so that happens a lot, too. I wonder how many times that gets solved that way. Ah, it does. 
You'd be surprised because, you know, a lot of these cold cases were done so long ago. Yeah. And we didn't have methods that we do now. Before forensic anthropologists were really a thing, you had medical examiners looking at skeletal remains and doing analysis. But medical examiners are, you know, they're doctors. They go through medical school, but they're not trained in forensic anthropology. You know, they might know a little bit about this or that, but they're not professionals. And so they get it wrong. One of my colleagues who's been working in this field forever has um, done a number of cases where uh, a medical examiner, you know, did the initial analysis and they couldn't find an identification. The medical examiner says, yeah, it's a male that's, you know, approximately, you know, 30 to 40 years of age and, you know, this and that. And, um, you know, several years down the line, he gets called up to exhume, you know, the remains to see if, they can't figure out who this person is. Exclamation happens. Looks at remains. It's like, well, it's not a male. It's a female. <laughs> Within hours, it's like this. They find. They identify them. That is crazy. It happens, and that's another reason why it's important as forensic anthropologists that we're not making mistakes, particularly not only just male, female, because that's kind of straightforward these days as far as like our methods have gotten very good at determining biological sex. Now we're not talking about gender, which is totally different, but you can estimate with a high degree, a very high degree of accuracy um, in most cases, if it's a male or female, if you have the appropriate bones to work with. And if you don't have the bones and you send it off for DNA, that's a very straightforward DNA uh, check. Sex is less of an issue more like than that ancestry that we were talking about before. And that's why it's super, super important that we're not, we're not taking our estimation of ancestry as, you know, the 100% gold standard of this is how this is what's going to identify this person. Because if you get it wrong, that person is, you know, potentially going to remain unidentified. You're unsure as to what the, you know, particular ancestry of this individual is don't don't estimate yeah. it when you are talking about if there's remains in the woods like how can you tell more than like a cop yeah well let's let's first start with skeletons that are on the surface you know when your body's put down it's going to get moved around by animals by weather all these factors are going to move these remains around um in in the woods but it, unless there's a skull mm -hmm. right I mean, or some huge identifying factor. It's it can be difficult for people to identify something as remains because they're not necessarily going to be bright white like your plastic skeleton, <laughs> Halloween skeleton that's hanging out in your garage. You know, they're not going to be like this white color most of the time. You know, I mean, they can get bleached over long periods of time from the sun. Most of the time, the bones are going to be the color of the ground that's around them, the soil color or the leaves scatter. They're going to be stained. A lot of times they blend in. They look like sticks or rocks. Really? Like, and let, like I said, unless you have a skull or something <laughs> that's totally like, oh, this is totally a femur because you've se we've seen all those movies where like, yeah. you know, somebody grabs a femur. And, yeah, you know. that's what I'm picturing. <laughs> we can go out there and find those stick looking, you know, bones in the rock you know, mimicking bones and we can, we can recover those in this and especially the small bones, you know, and, and I guess this, this is another reason why it's important to have an anthropologist out there to do these recoveries because we know what we're looking yeah. for. You know, there's two, there's 206 bones in the human adult skeleton and there's many more in children, subadult or juvenile remains. And, you know, they look very different. Really? They're not just like little mini femurs and mini skulls, you know. Can I just interject <laughs> really quick? Why do children have more bones than adults? Yeah, because their bones are, they don't, they don't, we don't pop out of the womb with like intact bones <laughs> that just get bigger yeah. over time. <laughs> um, they're pieces, they're tiny little pieces that actually fuse fused together over time. So okay. um, they definitely look like pebbles and little rocks and stuff. And so what, what fills the gaps then are is cartilage. And so um, I think you guys both mentioned you have children. Yeah, is we that, do. Yeah. yeah. So you probably heard of like that soft spot oh, yeah. on the head yep. of a child, you know, that's cartilage because their skull hasn't grown together yet. It hasn't fused. And so as the bones grow, um, they expand in size and that cartilage gets replaced by bone. Okay. And so, and then they fuse together. Oh. Yeah. And so that happens throughout all the bones of the, of the human skeleton. And so like, and it's variable depending on how old the child is. So as the child grows, they have fewer and fewer bones because they're fusing together. And Got so, yeah, it. so there's complicated, huh. you know, lots of complicated scenarios in why you would want a trained forensic anthropologist out there. Cause we know what we're looking for and we can identify that. I'm going to start looking around <laughs> on the ground to like, See rocks and sticks. I'm going to inspect them. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, Nikki, let's um, ask her a couple fun questions and then let her go because we have really kept her forever. I so. know. I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I've carved out the time today oh, for this. Oh, you're so, so it's sweet. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So we always ask kind of these random silly questions at the end. What song would be the perfect theme song for your job? Oh. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard when you think about it. Uh, you know, um, this is terrible, but you know, the, the theme song for the CSI Miami, it's like the who are you yes. the, from, you know, th- that's the, it really is the perfect song because our goal is to try to identify the person. It's like really the goal. And so that's like really a good one. I mean, <laughs> there's so many, I love that. like, uh, but I hate it because it's already taken, you know, it's like they already thought of that. It's like, oh, <laughs> sometimes branding is just so spot on. I was thinking of like the, the nursery rhyme one, like, the head bones connected to the <laughs> neck. <bones. laughs> if somebody decided that they were going to make a show about you, Hillary, who would you want to play you? Oh, wow. These are, these are like, God, this is kind of just exposing how not cool I am. <laughs> no. I'm, like, I'm like, who would ex- actually, you know, I don't remember the actress's name, but the, the woman who plays Deb on Dexter, Oh yes. yeah, you know, <laughs> because she is, you know, she's, you know, she's a single awesome woman. Um, very badass. Like, not that I'm a badass or anything. Like, I'm definitely not, <laughs> but like, it's like, but, uh, and she swears like a sailor and I'm like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so, like, I think it's Jennifer Carpenter. I think it's her name, but she's fantastic. I love her. Nikki, what do you got? What are your hobbies? What do you like to do? Well, I have two amazing senior dogs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, Uma and Chase, and they have been sleeping so well this whole time. So my hobbies include taking them with me wherever I can go. Um, they oftentimes go out to um, archaeology sites. They come to the oh, office. I love they, it. We go on walks. Yeah. And so they've been all over the U.S. with me. And um, so we've seen we've seen the sites. They are both... Um, over 11 years oh, old. Nice. So they're, they're my, they're my buddies. Yes. I do that. Um, I'm huge into cooking okay. as well. Oh, during 2020. Um, so I was a, a you know, pretty active person. And so I was going to the gym a lot, but then when the gyms closed down in 2020, I decided to rig up a home gym. And so, uh, 2020, I was really big into like weightlifting, like doing a lot of the power lifting. Those are some of my hobbies and activities that I like. to Nice. Do. I have one, um, that I like to ask too. What is something that you hoard? Oh, books. What do you like to read? Everything. Uh, but I love historical fiction, like real fiction. Like I'm such a dork. Oh, I love oh, it. Oh, not. <laughs> not at all. I love learning about the past. Like there's some really great authors out there. Like Eric Larson, um, he he wrote a book called Devil in the White City. Oh that my got God, totally I have hooked. that one. He also wrote In the Garden of Beasts, which was about pre-World War II Germany. Oh, I got to read like, that one. Right bef- oh, well, and I started reading it and I had to put it down because I was like, this is scary right now. So <laughs> I was like, uh, I can't. So I actually didn't finish it. I love historical fiction. I love anything history. Uh-huh. So those books are right up mm-hmm. my alley too. Mariah, you have one? Do you have any talents that you consider useless? <laughs> Some would say anthropology. No, just- <laughs> no not at all. <laughs> no, I was like, oh, you're never going to make any money with that. Oh. oh, yeah. I mean, I can play the clarinet. Oh, there you go. <laughs> hey. um, That's cool. Nikki, you got a final one? Um, if you could provide your services on any crime case past present, what would it? what would you want to work on? Dang. And you could even go way back in the past. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Or or I'm really super fascinated in some of like the, you know, just classical archaeology up in the Mediterranean um, as mm-hmm. well. Like that stuff is so incredible and would be amazing to work on. But I, I really find some of the um, archaeology and kind of a forensic analysis of the people who were in Pompeii in that, yeah. in that eruption, like super fascinating. Yes. You know, I mean, it's so compelling because it was like, you know, I've never studied it extensively or anything, so I don't know, you know, the ins and outs or the particular credibility of some of the claims. But, you know, saying that they were just like inundated with ash like so quickly that they had no opportunity to escape and you find them doing things that they were just engaged in at the so time crazy. That, that this happened. It's like gives you such an interesting picture of their life ways and who they were. And um, I think that's just so fascinating. I would love to go on to do something like that one day. That's a great answer. 
Well, Hillary, we have literally kept you so long that I'm not going to ask her any more questions. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank yes, you so much. Thank you. Yes. And you all have a fantastic yeah, day. Yeah, you do. We'll talk soon. She was so fun. I feel like she was someone we would hang out with. Yes. Right? Like I could see her like sitting on the couch with us, just like yes. talking some books. I thought the same thing. So much information that I didn't think went with that job. I mean, I feel like it's way more intense than you initially think. I think there's a lot of like confusion as to like how exact it is. They can give like an approximation. They can give like, they can narrow things down. But I think there is like that like misconception that like you're going to be able to know this for a fact, for a fact. And I'm sure some things are like not concrete. You know, like if someone was stabbed, like you're going to have the damage. Obviously you can't argue that. And I thought it was cool too how she was saying like, if you see bones in the forest, you would just see bones in the forest. Like how it almost camouflages, it takes on like its environment. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess this is like the problem with like Halloween, right? It's like you think that like when you see a bone, it's going to be like an intact, like a what femur. your skeleton looks like a hundred percent. It's just going to be like laying there and you're going to be like, oh, femur over here. Yeah. You know, but it's like crazy that she said, what was it? Like a look like a rock or twig, but was like a baby bone. Yes. Yeah. She said baby bones were like rocks. So it's like, I wonder how many times people have like, just like walked past that stuff and like not even realized. Kids are very gumby if you think about it now, because I was like thinking when she was saying like, well, you guys have kids and I'm thinking that when they're babies, yeah, you just feel like they have no bones. Like, well, yeah, like you're terrified to like do anything. Like a blob. I didn't even want to put clothes on them. Oh my God. Putting the like pullover onesies Ugh. on your newborn is like, you're like stretching their arm up. No. It's like the most terrifying thing. I made my mom do the bath for the first time. I honestly never changed a diaper before I had him. Really? Not even like babysitting or anything? No, I was not the friend that like held babies. Okay. Okay. Even after I had kids, I don't need to hold your baby because... <laughs> I don't need to be responsible for dropping them, breaking them, or doing anything. No. You don't want the pressure. It's like a high, high stakes position. Yeah, it's cute. It's cool. You got a baby, but I don't need the experience. Like, you know, when people like with puppies and they got to hold the puppy, I probably will hold a puppy before I hold the baby, <laughs> to oh, be really I'm honest. The polar opposite. Like, I love the smell of their heads, like the newborn smell. And I was like, mm. oh, I just want to like mother one and like smell it because it's just like <laughs> no l- oh I just love that no so and especially with the like holding them up and the the bones and the you know what I mean like it's just they're very fragile I will hold your baby eight nine months and above that's fair because I mean the first couple weeks are just like a sack of slime it's just real risky that's I just remembered is that why the kids, when they grow, they get the growing pains? Is that the bones? Oh, great question. I know. I just thought of that. Dang it. Well, Hillary, if you happen to be listening to your own episode, please we'd tell love us. to know the answer to that. So please just like <laughs> let us know because that's a great question that right? I wish that, that I know. would have asked you. Because I was like, oh, I'll remember. And now I know I should write it down. Oh, rookie mistake. Awful. But I thought she was great. Mm. I thought it was so interesting. And I really wish that she would do dinosaur bones on the side. Yeah, I thought that was cool. And then like the whole vet thing and like why it is obsessed with like history and war history. Uh, and so like, oh my God, he will crazy? like, that's amazing. I thought like, that was so cool. What a tribute cool. to those families to like get their loved ones back, even from like generations ago. Like that's so cool. I mean, all like any war, there's so many casualties. Like, how do you just deal with all those? Like, I'm picturing Game of Thrones, so I don't know if this is true. But like, you know, where they just like throw them all onto a pile and then they like do like a mass burn or whatever. But I don't even know if that's real. I should probably look that up to see how they did that, how they handled bodies in wars. Yeah, I mean, I guess it would be different maybe through the time period. Yeah, because I'm thinking Game of Thrones, which is also fantasy, and it doesn't exist. So I could be making I that mean, whole thing up. Let's see. How did they handle? I'm doing a Google search. Dead bodies in war. Mass. Mass. Mass wars. Let's see. Yeah, let's 
clarify that. Mitzi was saying that, remember back in the Civil Wars, that that's how embalming? Oh, embalming started, yeah. What does it say? What does Google say? I mean, it really goes into, like, each different war. Like, some of them would individually bury them on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Some would just do, like, one big, large mass grave. See, that's what I was thinking. So, I don't know. We're going to have to do a little more research. And if there's anyone listening to us that has any knowledge of that, let us know. Would love to know. Yeah, Hillary was great. I learned a lot. And I love that she got into it because of CSI. These shows are providing a cool platform for like more awareness of occupations in the field because when we were younger, these shows didn't exist. Do you remember when you had like career day? They were not doing these kind of jobs. It's neat to even just talk to all these people that have different jobs. I mean, her job is almost like an unsolved mysteries, I think, which has got to be frustrating too because if you just can't tell, that would be annoying. But yeah, it was, she was great. I hope we get some listener questions and then we can bring her back. Because that'd be fun oh, to that'd ask that'd be her. awesome. Yeah. So if you have questions, please send them to us. You can send them to us over Instagram or email us. We'd love to hear from you guys so that we can bring Hillary back. Ask her some of your guys' questions. All right. Thanks for this, this good one. Yes. Until next time. See you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening and supporting us. We do encourage you to follow us at Instagram at Body to Burial. Hit us up on Twitter at Body to Burial. And you guessed it, you can send us an email to hello at body to burial.com. If you have any guest suggestions, just let us know. Please hit the subscribe button or follow button on whatever app you are listening to. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time.